and Joe Biden, who has, he's really the only one in the whole entire world that has the power to stop this, say, within the next hour, literally, by just turning off the faucet, pulling the plug, no more bombs, no more guns, no more bullets, no more nothing until you, Mr. Netanyahu, stop the slaughter. And um, we're the bank for this, folks, you and me, how much we give each year. Collectively, it's a lot of money. And President Biden, you have to do your part. Why are you risking having even 10,000 people not show up who are just deciding, they've already decided they're not going to vote because of this? Hillary lost Michigan by 10,000 votes. Don't make the same mistake, please. You just listened to a snippet from Michael Moore's latest podcast where he pleads with Biden to stop supporting Netanyahu's genocide in Gaza because doing so could literally cost him the election in November. Now, he goes on to make not just a political argument, but he also tries to appeal to Biden's sense of morality and Catholicism, saying, quote, you know who you are and what you have to do. You must have thought it. You must have thought about it during mass on Easter. Public opinion is completely against this ethnic cleansing. And he goes on to add, it's been just an awful thing for all of us to be witness to. We'd like to think about it because our president, the one that has to stop Trump from winning in November, is the number one financial backer and the number one arms dealer for the state of Israel. So what do we do with that? Yeah, and what he's saying here is particularly important after 48,000 people in Wisconsin voted uncommitted on Tuesday's primary, a state that Biden won in 2020 with just 20,000 more votes than Trump. And this comes as a Wall Street Journal poll finds that he's neck and neck with Trump in the state. But that same poll also shows that Biden is losing to Trump in every other key swing state. Pennsylvania by three, Nevada by four, Michigan by three, North Carolina by six, Arizona by five, and Georgia by one. An aggregate national poll show that Trump is narrowly leading Biden overall. Now, to be clear, Biden isn't trailing Trump because people are flipping and voting for Trump instead. He's trailing Trump because large portions of his own base are planning to stay home because they are disillusioned with his unwavering support for Israel. And ahead of Tuesday's vote, MSNBC reporter Maya Eaglin spoke to students in Wisconsin about why they're choosing to cast protest votes. And uh, here's what they had to say. We've seen tens of thousands of primary voters cast uncommitted votes throughout the country already. Over 89,000 in Washington, 52,000 in Colorado, and 101,000 in Michigan. And the young voters I spoke with in Wisconsin or are organizing another wave of these protest votes through the unconstructed movement to voice their disappointment with Biden's response to the war in Gaza. Take a look. Wisconsinites have had enough. Hala Ahmed is a Palestinian American and the Listen to Wisconsin spokesperson. Their campaign officially kicked off in Milwaukee on March 19th. I think the Democratic Party has lost all legitimacy in our communities. The campaign's goal is to get at least 20,000 people in Wisconsin to vote uninstructed, which means uncommitted or choosing no candidate. That number is roughly the same number of votes that won Biden the state in the 2020 general election. If in November we still don't have a ceasefire, I don't know what will be left in Gaza. And that's our focus in this campaign. A March Gallup poll found that 55% of Americans disapprove of Israel's military action in Gaza. But that number is even higher at 63% when looking at just voters between the ages of 18 and 34. Another young voter involved in the uninstructed movement is 22-year-old Dahlia Saba. This is a campaign that's being run by students and by young people who really care about this. Saba has family in Gaza and says organizing protest efforts in Wisconsin allows her to feel empowered. Joe Biden has already um, won the Democratic nomination. So the uninstructed campaign is really a way of sending a message. It is not about him actually becoming president or not. It is a way for us to quantify, this is how many people care about this issue. We are Democrats, we are voting in the Democratic primary. These are your constituents and your policy is alienating them. I feel like this is obvious, but if voters in swing states like Wisconsin and Michigan really do choose to stay home and Biden does lose them permanently, Trump wins. And if that happens, Biden and Biden alone will be the one to blame because their message 
couldn't be more clear. Stop supporting genocide or lose their votes. And down-ballot Democrats are also worried that Biden's support for Israel could cost them their elections as well, and they're right to be worried because this is deeply, deeply troubling to people. They are morally outraged that our government is supporting this. That is a legitimate concern. And Michael Moore isn't the only celebrity that's telling Biden to take concerns of these voters seriously because Democratic Party loyalists like Sonny Hostin, who has loyally supported the Democratic Party for years, is also saying what Michael Moore is saying. Take these voters seriously. Do not take them for granted. Let's watch. You know, I, I don't think that you can tell people whose families have been killed, um, whole entire lines of their families have been murdered. Um, 30, over 32,000 people, women and children, the majority, that, well, but if Trump wins, it would be better. The problem here is well, be, that- It would be worse. It would be worse. The problem here is that they are making themselves known. Michigan has about 200,000 Muslim voters. They are losing their family members, and the United States the, the UN has found is complicit in that, and that is because the United States sends $3.8 billion worth of aid to Israel, and that also includes arming them. Social scientists have found that if the United States stopped providing that aid, the okay. war would be clear, over. The Can are, I just, are, let oh, me yeah. just finish this. The war would be over in three days. And she's right. That's why people are leveraging their votes to get Biden to stop. But the problem is the Democratic Party elites tend to just disregard what their own base wants. This isn't the first time that they've done it, and I'm sure it won't be the last. And I say this because Sonny Hostin was actually responding to uh, this comment from Hillary Clinton on Jimmy Fallon's show. What do, you, what do you say to voters who are upset that those are the two choices? Get over yourself. Those are the two choices. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Right? Now, it's easy for her to say that as a warmonger and fellow supporter of Israel's genocide. But the problem is no amount of scolding voters is going to persuade them to vote for you. Hillary, of all people, should know this since her hubris is in part why Trump became president in the first place. But Stephen A. Smith was actually asked about her comments. And I think that he did a perfect job at articulating everything that I wanted to say about this and then more. Let's watch. I don't think it was a very wise statement on her part. How did that work out for her in 2016? I think that's something that we have to recognize. Yes, yeah, she won the popular vote, but at the end of the day, she wasn't the president of the United States. It was him. You can look at her not campaigning in Wisconsin in the last days, not campaigning in Pennsylvania in the last days. You can look at some of the stuff that they were saying about her that sort of distracted things from where it should have been in terms of Comey and his report uh, from the FBI. You can bring up a whole bunch of things, but at the end of the day, the last thing you need to do is to do anything that could agitate a potential voter in this particular but election. What do you make about the actual argument that she's making? I mean, she's basically saying two old people, yes, yes. but they're substantively different. I mean, Absolutely. Well, 91 listen. counts against him. Well, listen, if you're nobody's not. brought that up more than me. Uh, for, yeah. you know, four indictments, 91 counts, impeached twice. I'm not voting for him. I've said that to a lot of people. I've said that to you. But at the end of the day, what I'm saying is, is that at some point in time, you got to take into account what the voters thinking about. The voters, a lot of them out there, tens of millions of them out there, by the way, don't care what he's going through right now. They don't care about his guilt or innocence, his perceived guilt or innocence. They don't care about the 91 counts. They're thinking about their lives. And a lot of times we see politicians taking the positions that they're taking and while we can respect their candor and their honesty, they do seem a bit detached at time from what the voters are actually feeling and what the voters are actually thinking. Nobody wants to hear that from Hillary Rodham Clinton at this particular moment in time, because especially if you're Joe Biden, what are you really, really worried about right now? You're worried about folks coming to the polls. You're worried about them showing up to the polls to vote for you. You're not worried even about them voting for Trump. You're worried about them not showing up to vote for yeah. you. That doesn't exactly encourage them to get up out of their seats. Exactly. Every single thing that he said there is spot on. But to say politicians are detached from voters is a bit of an understatement given the events that transpired this week. For example, Israel deliberately targeted and murdered seven World Central Kitchen workers. And I say that this was deliberate because they triple tapped them and they knew their location since the group gave the IDF their route so they wouldn't be targeted. But they were targeted anyway. They were triple tapped. In fact, the IDF dropped a bomb directly on the logo that was on the roof of their car 
while they were traveling through a deconflicted zone, mind you. And it's not the first time that they've done this. In 2006, they dropped a bomb right on the logo of a Red Cross ambulance. So we know what they're doing. This was targeted and they targeted aid workers because, as Sean put it, their goal is to reduce the aid Palestinians are getting because it is using starvation as a weapon, as evidenced by the fact that they are blocking aid from getting in and their own defense minister said that they would be cutting off food at the start of this siege. So this is all purposeful. Now, how does the Biden administration respond to this? Because normal people see this and they're outraged, rightfully so. Well, John Kirby's response was basically, eh, what are you going to do? It sounds based on what Jose Andres has said that these workers were doing everything right. Their vehicle was marked. They were in a safe zone. Yeah. What more could they have done? Yeah, it's really, uh, I mean, it, it, it's uh, devastating to, to see these uh, images and to hear these early reports about the steps that they tried to take to protect themselves. Um, but the Israelis, look, they've already said uh, this was on them, and they're doing this investigation. We obviously want to want to make sure that that investigation gets completed and is as transparent as possible. And as I said in my opening statement, that there's accountability to be to be held here. It sure is crazy how many unintentional murders of aid workers and journalists and journalist families and medics and children that we keep seeing. It almost feels like to me that they're doing this on purpose. And whenever they say it was an accident or they deny culpability, they're lying because they are. But I mean, if you buy the lies of the Israeli government, first and foremost, I've got a bridge to sell you, but you at least have to concede that they're maybe being a little bit too careless. So perhaps the US government might wanna condition aid at a minimum, just so they feel a little bit of pressure to be less careless, right? That's if we're being very, very charitable, more charitable than we should be, right? Since we're giving them the bombs that they're accidentally dropping on non-combatants, maybe we should consider conditioning aid. Is that even a possibility? Of course not. How can they? How can the U.S. continue to send military aid military to assistance. Israel without any conditions? Is there no red line that no, can help? You know, we've had this we've had this discussion, you and me, quite a bit from up here. Um, they're still under a viable threat of Hamas. Um, we're still going to make sure that they can defend themselves, and the seventh of October doesn't happen again. That doesn't mean that it's a free pass that that we that we look the other way when something like this happens, or that we aren't and haven't since the beginning of the conflict urged the Israelis to be more precise, to be more careful, uh, and quite frankly to uh, increase the, num the the amount of humanitarian assistance that gets in. Um, uh, you know. I haven't been asked about it yet, but I expect that I would be. You know, there was a discussion just yesterday with our Israeli counterparts about Rafah. Now, this one was done virtually. We expect it will be an in-person meeting here in, uh, in a week's time or so. Uh, but the whole reason to have that meeting was to talk about our concerns over a major ground operation in Rafah and to present viable alternatives for them to be more precise and more targeted. So the idea that we're uh, we're, we're some plastic graveyard here, and we're not paying attention to uh, to the civilian casualties or the civilian suffering is just not true. Right, but these are verbal urgings, verbal commitments. There's no other incentive besides. I, I, I know you want us to right? you want us to hang some sort of condition over their neck, and what I'm telling you is that we continue to to to, to work with the Israelis to make sure that they are as precise as keep, as they can be, and that more aids getting in, and and we're going to continue to to take that approach. And you said that uh, the questioner wanted you to hang some conditions over their necks, that the Israelis, and your tone suggested you wouldn't do that. Why not? I've already answered this question a whole bunch of times. Uh, we believe that the approach that we're taking um, is working in terms of uh, making it clear to the Israelis what our expectations are. Well, on the point of conditions, the president on February 8th issued a memo, and it said, uh, and you already know this, but just for context, it said that it was the policy of this administration to prevent arms transfers that risk facilitating or otherwise contributing to violations of human rights or international humanitarian law. Is firing a missile at people delivering food and killing them not a violation of international humanitarian law? Well, the Israelis have already admitted that uh, this was a mistake that they made. They're doing an investigation. They'll get to the bottom of this. Let's not get ahead of that. Um, your, your question presumes, at this very early hour, that it was a deliberate strike, that they knew exactly what they were hitting, that they were hitting aid workers and did it on purpose, and there's no evidence of that. I would also remind you, sir, that 
We continue to look at incidents as they occur. The State Department has a process in place. And to date, as you and I are speaking, they have not found any incidents where the Israelis have violated international humanitarian law. And lest you think we don't take it seriously, I can assure you that we do. We look at this in real time. They have never violated international humanitarian law ever in the past five to six months. I'm telling you, the State Department has looked at incidents in the past and has yet to determine that any of those incidents violate international humanitarian law. Of course, the State Department said that because if it were the case that they found Israel in violation of international law, then sending them aid would be illegal under domestic law, specifically the Foreign Assistance Act. So they're choosing to pretend like Israel is following international law, even though Israel already admitted that they're not. And I say this because cutting off food is collective punishment, which is a war crime that is illegal under international law. They admitted that they're doing that at the start of this siege. But yet, they're following international law according to the State Department. Sure. It's so fucking infuriating. In other words, Israel can literally do whatever the fuck they want. They could do anything, and the Biden administration is never going to hold them accountable. Not even entertain the notion of conditioning aid. That's how despicable we are. This is what Stephen A. Smith meant when he said politicians are detached because normal people react to the purposeful murder of aid workers with outrage and expect accountability. But when it comes to Biden, we do get the fake outrage at least, but no accountability. And that's the problem. For example, he tweeted about how outraged and heartbroken he was that the genocidal country he's funding murdered seven humanitarian aid workers. But as you can see, Nina Turner ratioed him with the thing that we're all thinking, stop sending them them our money and bombs now but he's not going to stop he's not even going to condition aid to israel he's going to let them continue to get away with literal murder even if it jeopardizes his own re-election chances which netanyahu wants by the way because he definitely wants to see trump back in office because trump gave him more things than any other president gave him he gave him the golan heights he recognized jerusalem as the capital of israel and moved the embassy there so netanyahu wins if biden loses and biden is too stupid to get that or doesn't care about that now i say biden is going to continue to let them get away with murder because earlier in the day before he made that tweet he was pressuring congress to approve one of the largest arms sales to israel in years and as politico reports he's digging his heels in even more and is refusing to change his israel policy even though officials within his own fucking administration disagree with him and i cannot stress this enough biden knows that the american people find this unacceptable it's not just celebrities like michael moore and sonny hostin who are begging him to listen to his own constituents it's palestinian doctors like tara maud who did this when he had the chance to confront biden to his face you know we had shown up to this meeting really concerned about what was taking place in the Gaza Strip, and I'm glad that you mentioned that we were, you know, insisting that there not be any food there. It made no sense for us to sort of break bread while talking about a famine taking place. Um, we had shown up, and the president and the vice president, the national security advisor are in the room, and it was very brief comments by the president saying he wants to hear from us and he wants to listen to us. And so I spoke first, and I let him know that I am from a community that's reeling. We are grieving. Uh, we, our heart is broken for what's been taking place over the last six months. And that the rhetoric that has been coming out of the Biden administration, that's been coming out of the White House, it's frustrated a lot of people, especially people who are Palestinian Americans, Muslim Americans, Arab Americans. We are not satisfied with what has taken place. There has been no concrete steps. But keep in mind, we're very concerned about the people that are over in the Gaza Strip that are in Palestine right now, who are not just starving, but are facing the threat of a looming Rafah invasion. And so I was able to share that with the president and let him know that out of respect for my community, out of respect for all of the people who have suffered and who have been killed in the process, I need to walk out of the meeting. And I want to walk out uh, with decision makers and let them know what it feels like uh, for somebody to say something and then walk away from them and not hear them out and not hear their response. Wow. I mean, what did, how did President Biden respond to that? You know, there wasn't a lot of response. He actually said that he understood. And I walked away. And I think, you know, for me, just like many of the other Palestinian Americans and Palestinians, or as I mentioned, many of the people who are interested in what's going on, we're panicking. 
I mean, we're talking about 1.7 million people are in Rafah right now. And we heard that there was a UN security resolution that had passed and the US abstained. And we were thrilled about this, but only moments later to have that sort of joy ripped from us when our own White House is saying, oh, it's a non-binding resolution. They're undermining the very UN Security Council resolution that's calling for a ceasefire. Okay, well then let's take about what happens next. Oh, then we hear that there's an arms transfer that's going to take place, and we know that included in these arms transfers are these 2,000 palm bounds that are leveling neighborhoods. I mean, I was in Gaza in January. I saw the devastation of Khan Yunus. I saw Deir al-Balah. I mean, these bombs are wreaking havoc, and people are fleeing to the south, to Rafah, the southern edge of Gaza, bordering up against Egypt. And we're transferring more bombs, more bullets, more fighter jets. What's going to happen to those people in Rafah? I mean, I'm telling you that every single humanitarian aid organization, every single person invested in what's taking place and watching, we are trying to scream at the top of our lungs, please, we cannot allow a ground invasion to take place. We need food to be able to enter and it to be distributed safely. And I'm glad you mentioned the tragic loss of the world's central kitchen workers who were a part of an approved route. I mean, these are people who are coordinating and just trying to deliver food to hungry people. And they're assassinated in the process. So make no mistake about it, Biden knows his own base wants him to stop arming this genocidal regime, but he is choosing to continue doing it, even though he knows it could cost him the election in November. So every single time he feigns concern about civilian casualties or aid workers, it's like a slap in the face to his own constituents because we all know he doesn't actually mean it based on his actions. If he did mean it, he'd cut off the weapons, but he's not willing to do that. So... He's full of shit. He can't feign ignorance at this point. Like he just, he knows what the uncommitted and uninstructed voters want, but he's willfully choosing to disregard them because he presumably doesn't think he needs them. In fact, Biden is actually doubling down on his effort to court moderate Nikki Haley voters who are much less concerned about Gaza genocide than his own base. So, I mean, why kowtow to the tens of thousands of disillusioned Democrats in swing states when you can make up for their absence with disillusioned Republican voters? In fact, This was uh, the strategy for Democrats back in 2016, if some of you will recall, as explained by Chuck Schumer. For every blue-collar Democrat we will lose in Western PA, we will pick up two, three uh, moderate Republicans in the suburbs of Philadelphia. And you can repeat that in Ohio and Illinois and Wisconsin. Turns out that didn't happen, and Trump ended up winning, and conservatives got a supermajority on the Supreme Court. Now, I'm not saying that Biden shouldn't court moderate Republicans, but what I am saying is that campaigning to them shouldn't come at the expense of outreach to your own base. Furthermore, how you court moderate Republicans matters, right? If you compromise your own principles and go too far to the right, you risk alienating your own base even further. And that's not conjecture. That's not Michael saying it. It's political science research out of Europe that confirms shifting to the right does not help liberal parties win votes. In particular, adopting right wing policies with regard to immigration and the economy really turns off your own supporters. And as Professor Tariq Shadi puts it, conservative voters tend to prefer the original to the copy. And logically so. Now, when you listen to Biden's xenophobic rhetoric on the border as of late and all of this effort that he's putting into courting Nikki Haley voters, it really does feel like he's giving up on his own base since they're pissed off at him and he doesn't want to change his Israel policy. So maybe he just feels like it's easier to court them and win that way. And I hope that that's not the case. But if it is, he's going to lose this election. But this video is already long enough. So I'm just going to end by... uh, saying that the situation is so dire that mainstream media outlets are now saying what progressives like myself have been screaming about for years. Listen to your goddamn base. They're not cursing, but they're saying that, and they're telling him that you can't win without them. I think by now, if we haven't learned the lessons from 2016, then we are purposefully trying to lose this election because it couldn't be more obvious. Biden has received the message. He's just choosing to not listen. He's choosing to disregard it, which means that if he loses this election, he can't blame voters. It'll be his fault and his fault alone. And no amount of scolding from losers like Hillary Clinton is going to change that reality. You know, you, you, you know, you know, the, you know, the thing, thing.
You're getting nervous, man, man. 